Welcome to the February 9th meeting of the Jefferson County Board of Education. Prior to this meeting, the Board of Education held an organization meeting and conducted a work session on the equity scorecard. Now, please join us for our traditional moment of silence. Okay, it's my pleasure now to invite the students who are going to be recognized this evening to come forward and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Board member Steph Horn will now read our vision statement. All JCPS students graduate prepared to reach their full potential and contribute to our society throughout life. Thank you, Ms. Horn. Um, it is now my pleasure to invite our um, recognitions and resolutions to begin. Thank you. Dr. Hargan's board chair, Diane, David Jones, Jr., and members of the Jefferson County Board of Education, we begin with the recognition of Sonny Pobelsic, a student at the Brown School, who won first place honors in the National Radon Poster Contest for her creative poster titled Radon Attack of the Silent Killer. In honor of her outstanding accomplishment, she received $1,000 and a laptop computer. Sunny was one of more than 3,500 students from 26 states who submitted entries for the poster contest. The entries were judged on content accuracy, visual communication of the topic, and originality. Board Vice Chair Diane Porter, please come forward to extend congratulations to Sunny. Joining in the recognition is her principal, Tim Healy. I 
would like to ask her parents to stand to be recognized also. <laughs> Next, we have the honor of recognizing students from Atherton, Butler Traditional, DuPont Manual, and more <coughs> traditional high schools for receiving the 2014 Berea College Pinnacle Scholar Award of Excellence, which recognizes high school seniors who have demonstrated excellence in and contributed significantly to the fields of science, music, and service. The award program helps the college to fulfill its mission of serving the region through a focus on learning, labor, and service. Board Vice Chair Diane Porter, please congratulate Danielle Gray, student at DuPont Manual High School. Joining in the recognition is her principal, Jerry Mays. <laughs> Board Chair David Jones, Jr., please extend congratulations to Jeremy Jackson and Rudell Valdez, students at Atherton High School. Joining in the recognition is their principal, Dr. Thomas Aberly. <laughs> Board member Chuck Hadaway, please come forward and congratulate Butler Traditional High School students, Jean Clark, Kaylee Kruler, Nicholas Baum Albin, and Victoria Dobson. Joining in the recognition is their principal, William Allen, and senior counselor, Mike Stite. Board member Lisa Wilner, please congratulate more traditional student Keenan Seifer. Joining in the recognition is his principal, Vicki Letty. <laughs> At this time, I would like to ask all parents of these outstanding students to please stand and be recognized. We are so very proud to recognize Allison Vitato, principal of Brackenridge Franklin Elementary School, for receiving the Milken Family Foundation National Educator Award. The awards program was created in 1985 to recognize and reward elementary and secondary teachers, principals, and specialists who exemplify exceptional <coughs> educational talent, leadership, professional accomplishment, <coughs> involvement in their community, and a strong commitment to furthering excellence in education. The program is the nation's most well-known teacher recognition program, which has honored more than 2,600 educators with more than 65 million in unrestricted cash awards. Board Vice Chair Diane Porter, please come forward to congratulate Allison. It is an honor to bestow recognition upon Michelle Dillard, Assistant Superintendent for Achievement Area 4, for receiving the Community Leadership Award from the Woodman of the World. Michelle was honored for serving with distinction as principal of Seneca High School for her leadership and advancement of schools in Achievement Area 4 and for making a difference in the lives of her students and community. Board Chair Davis Jones, Jr., please congratulate Michelle Dillard. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Hargens and members of the Jefferson County Board of Education. This concludes our recognitions for tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, at this moment, would like to take a, a quick uh, privilege of the chair and recognize my predecessor, Diane Porter, with the award of this ceremonial gavel, which she wielded with great effect over the last two years. Um, it says, Diane Porter, JCBE chairwoman, June 2012 till December 2014, so let's walk up there and get our photo. Is there a motion to receive the recognitions? Mr. Hathaway moves. Mr. Brady seconds. All in favor, aye. Motion carries unanimously. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes of our prior meeting? Mr. Brady moves. Mr. Hathaway seconds. All in favor, aye. All right, those are approved. Um, at this point, it is our custom to invite any of our students and special guests who would like to leave and go and do their homework to do so. <laughs> I would tell you though, if you leave now, you're gonna miss not only the superintendent's report, but the mayor's speech. So um, you may want to stay, and um, if you do, we'll take a quick break after the, uh, after the mayor as well. So, um, wow, you're a powerful draw, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> this is impressive. All right, we are going to move on now to the superintendent's report. So, Superintendent Hargens. Thank you, Chair Jones. Uh oh, they are leaving. <laughs> I take it back. I take it back. So much homework. How do you, what's the, the is there some Latin expression about glory is fleeting or something like that? <laughs> All right. Sorry, later? Later, okay. All right, don't let me forget. Okay. Okay, Superintendent. Chair Jones, members of the board, it's my pleasure to call to your attention a few items of special interest. Congratulations, first of all, to all the 2015 Gold Key, Silver Key, and Honorable Mention winners that were showcased at the Kentucky Museum of Art and Craft. The talent in JCPS is amazing. We know that learning is the constant, time and support of the variables. Amounts of time and support are what we need to be different for each student to achieve. On January 30th, there were 704,452 intervention hours recorded on Infinite Campus, and 21,672 students had at least one hour recorded. The foundation of Vision 2015 is values. Value number one is our students are cared for and treated as our own. Value number nine is adults model integrity, respect, creativity, and accountability. Educational researcher Doug Reeves teaches us two things. An effective strategic plan should be able to fit on one page, and ours does. And number two, that every adult in the system should be as accountable as every student in the system is. It is a privilege to serve our students. We hold positions of a sacred trust, ensuring the well-being of the students in our care. I'm sure you have seen news reports that three adults trusted to serve our students in our school district have been charged with breaking the law. 
a custodian, a school resource officer, and a principal. The separate incidents are under investigation and review. At this point, I do not know what will result from the charges, but here is what I do know as a superintendent of the Jefferson County Public School System. Our students are why we exist. Each student matters. Every day we will hold our students accountable for their actions, and every adult must be held accountable as well. Speaking of accountability, we are working diligently to implement the recommendations of the state audit. The audit found that the internal audit's current practice of reporting directly to the superintendent does not provide the independence needed within our organization, and our policies did not govern the internal audit activities. You approved the contract award with Dean, D Dean Dort and Alan Ford on December 15th. They are now in the process of addressing each of the three internal audit findings. An internal audit charter was provided to the board in draft form last Friday. The charter addresses these findings. The intent is to bring it to the board for approval on February 23rd. Finding three of the state audit found that salaries of our central office employees were significantly higher on average than three peer district. As recommended by the state audit, we have contracted with Management Advisory Group International to conduct a compensation study which will compare JCPS to our peer district <coughs> and private industry where applicable. Members of the firm presented to every administrator in the district an overview of the process that will be used for this review. We are on step two of an eight step process and I will keep you updated. Throughout the audit, transparency was an important recommendation. In response, we contracted with Tyler Technologies to implement the Citizens Transparency website. At this point, the reconciliation of expenditures is not complete, but I want to tell you we're making progress. Out of, remember I told you we were $250 million off, then $120 million off? Out of a total, um, and that's with the dashboard, out of a total expenditure of $1.4 billion in fiscal year 2014, general fund expenditures in this new uh, dashboard are within four million and the total expenditures are now within 32 million. So we are close and remember we talked about transparent but not correct gets us nowhere. So we're looking for transparency and accuracy. Let me highlight in our meeting powerful examples of community partnerships. The mayor and I will in a few minutes be reviewing the progress from the joint commitment of JCPS and Metro govern government to work together to improve educational outcomes. And three partnerships are also on the consent agenda. Through an agreement, JCPS students are able to earn <coughs> college credit from the University of Louisville. Earning college credit in high school gives students a head start to college. For example, in 1213, students took a total of 336 courses, earning a total of 1,036 credit hours while they were in high school. The collaboration between U of L and Cochrane in the city elementary will provide per, for professional growth for Cochrane teachers as they mentor student teachers. Our students will benefit from JCPS <coughs> teachers growing and student teachers providing their hands, hearts, and enthusiasm in the classroom. Item Roman numeral 8R is about the elementary <coughs> school that the board approved to be built at Norton Commons. This is about JCPS and the YMCA collaborating to provide aligned opportunities for our students. This is more than a facility. This is a true partnership. <coughs> Thanks to YMCA President and CEO Steve Tarver, and I know he's here and we'd like to recognize him. If you stand, Steve. Chief Operations Officer Dr. Razor, Director of Facilities Mike Mulhern, and Board Member Debbie Westlin, and now Board Member Stephanie Horn, for working on this very important project. And actually, what we like are cost savings. Cost savings due to this joint venture by the Y. The Y is splitting the cost evenly on the gym, total value with design and construction of approximately $2 million. So the approximate $1 million contribution by the YMCA paid for four extra preschool classrooms, totaling now eight for the facility, and also paid for many of the energy upgrades. 
And it said that a picture is worth a thousand words. So there's a rendering of the elementary school that will be built at Norton Common. Chair Jones, this concludes my report and my recommendation for approval of the consent agenda, agenda later in the meeting. Great, thank you very much. Um, it's now um, time to move on to action items, of which there are none, and then to information items, um, the first of which is the um, report from the, um, what is, well, the mayor's report. Um, but before that, for some reason, we ask whether there are speakers on this item before it is given. Are there any speakers on this item? Okay, seeing none. Dr. Hargens, would you like to introduce it? Absolutely. It's an honor to have Mayor Greg Fisher with, with us uh, this evening, but it really is most exciting that we have a joint commitment to improve educational outcomes in Louisville, Kentucky. Thank you, uh, thank you, Superintendent, and thanks to all the board members for the work that you all do day in and day out. You have probably the most important jobs in the city, and I know you put in a lot of hours and time and a lot of years, so thank you on behalf of the city. Uh, the joint commitment to improve education outcomes, well, let's talk a little bit about the genesis of this. Uh, one of the things that uh, can bother me in my position as mayor is that there's a lot of people that want to be critical, uh, but there's not nearly as many people that want to help. And when we took a look at what our role was in the mayor's office with making sure all of our citizens, especially our young citizens uh, that are students, uh, we want them to have every chance to succeed. And so while the city does not control our JCPS, uh, these are our kids, and we certainly do a lot of actions in the community that are geared toward their success. So we could just stay on the sidelines or we could jump in the game. Uh, we've got to jump in the game because our, certainly our kids deserve that, and then we deserve, they deserve for uh, JCPS and the city to have a, a functioning uh, working partnership so that we can make sure our efforts are aligned. So with that basic principle and with uh, Dr. Hargens and I discussed this, uh, we said, how about if we develop a joint commitment because clearly the community is always hearing from JCPS with all of the testing that you all have done and, and what the various deadlines are, but they don't often hear enough about what the cities, and by the cities, I mean not just our organizations like some that are represented here today with Metro United Way and YMCA and 55K, but the citizens as well. Uh, it's easy for citizens to kind of step back and act like mm -hmm. it's not their responsibility for our largest public school system to succeed. And it's my belief that with over 100,000 uh, of our kids in the school, 15% of the city's population, it's everybody's responsibility that JCPS succeeds. So with that, we wanted to develop this joint commitment to lay out what the city's and the citizens' responsibilities were, as well as what JCPS responsibilities were, which, as I said, is uh, well documented. I think one of the main principles, and Superintendent Hargens uh, said it, that learning is the constant, time is the variable. Mm -hmm. And the, the big issue is our kids that don't have all the advantages that some other kids have. The most advantaged kids in our communities have plenty of opportunities for out of school time activity, camps they go to, uh, extra learning at night. Uh, so they have lots of time to learn, not just in the classroom. So the critical question for us is how do we make sure that all kids have more time to learn? And that's where the various city resources come into play. So the actual vision, what we see in the mind's eye, is that there is a world-class, seamless, coordinate, coordinated education system uh, where we are preparing students to be the next engaged citizens and the civic leaders. And one of the things, uh, when I came to um, Jefferson County in 11-12, all the pieces are here. So one of the things I used to say is if we could ever get everybody rowing in the right direction, rowing together in the right direction, and that's what this vision is about. Everybody rowing in the same direction toward a seamless education 
uh, system. And what the mayor talks about all the time is uh, about learning and lifelong learning. And learning is a 24-7 uh, kind of uh, opportunity, and it's not just during school. So the goal is really through this commitment to move Louisville into the top tier among its peer cities by raising education attainment so that by 2020 at least 40% of working adults hold a bachelor's degree uh, and 10% an associate's degree. And this goal represents 55,000, of course, more degrees by 2020. And we're making good progress with 55K. Uh, I want to recognize Mary Gwen Wheeler. She's here. She's our chair of 55K, our executive director. Thank you, Mary Gwen. <laughs> we, uh, with this last year, we're at 41.2% of our adults having either a two or four year degree. The national average is 39%. Uh, we need to keep moving to get to 50 percent and beyond, but we're making progress. The priorities of our joint commitment are, are simple when you read them, but complex to execute. But much of what you're going to be hearing tonight from us is enhancing our citizens' uh, view of education as a system. Uh, from the very beginning, from the very end, these are not disconnected silos. These are different elements of a system that must all be healthy for our kids to have the best chance to succeed. And the most critical part, obviously, or a critical part, is making sure our kids are ready for school. As we know, many of our youngest citizens show up three years behind their peers at the age of six. And it's very difficult for those kids to, uh, to catch up. And we'll talk more about our advocacy in that area le later. Second is we want uh, our, our students to be successful in school. So when they finish uh, grade 12, they are college and career ready, and they have choices, and they know what those choices are, and they can make wise decisions. And then last, they're prepared to succeed. So we know that if our students don't go beyond a high school degree, most of them are going to be living with poverty wages the rest of their life. And nobody runs up to me and says that's what their goal is. So it's our job to create expectations for them to have specialized skills, it could be an apprenticeship program, it could be a certificate, hopefully it's a two-year or four-year degree, but something beyond high school. The mayor and I share a love of data, so what would a commitment be without metrics? So what you can see on this chart are our metrics. Uh, as the mayor talked about, getting all of our children ready to learn and being kindergarten ready, and as you can see from this chart, we have had a 17.3% increase and we're at 51.9%. But that still means that one out of two of our students aren't ready for kindergarten, and there's lots of work to be done. When you look at the percent of uh, JCPS students who graduate on time in four years, we've had an 11.2% increase, that's at 79%, and our students scoring college and career ready has increased as well, 15.4 percentage points. But we know that the percent of JCPS graduates who enroll in post-secondary education, that has had a slight decrease. So less of our students over time are actually enrolling. And we've got lots of work to be done uh, with summer melt and students who actually never get uh, to college. And slightly the percent of JCPS graduates who complete uh, degrees or certificates has increased slightly, but again, that's only a third of our graduates, or less than a third of our graduates. Our partnership includes seven intentions, and so I'm, we're going to run through those now. Uh, the first is to uh, collaborate on legislative agendas in support of public education. <coughs> so our focus here is, uh, for me, where we have areas that we can work together on to help advocate in Frankfurt on behalf of JCPS. Uh, an area that I'm particularly intense on, you could tell, uh, given my earlier comments, was early childhood funding. Uh, this is a major national issue for us. It's a state issue. Uh, it's a local issue. The data behind this challenge is more and more apparent, and I think it's imperative both on the national level and local levels that uh, we decide to invest in our youngest citizens so that they can get ahead. Uh, also, K-12 to funding. Uh, is critical for us uh, as well to enhance our funding and our effectiveness in this area and for all students. Uh, you all face uh, problems that we face with the city as well. In particular, uh, it's increasing our overall achievement, but also then digging down into our areas where we need help. Uh, the gaps that we have with our boys of color is a significant issue for the city, not just our city, but all cities at the same time. So how we continue to tackle that challenge is something I know you all take seriously and the city does as well. 
Uh, so that's a little collaboration. Secondly is communications. We wanted to create an environment between JCPS and the city where co communication was frequent, it was regular, uh, it is a normal thing for Anthony Smith, who runs our office in safe and healthy neighborhoods, uh, to pick up the phone or, and call John Marshall and vice versa. We have a really, I think, a pretty seamless relationship that's focused just on moving the community forward. Doesn't matter what your title is or what your role is, the focus is on our kids and our community. So we've achieved that through regular meetings of our cabinets, one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions, uh, and we're, we feel like we're making good progress in the fact that we work together as a team with no silos there. Uh, also part of our commitment was to hold a biannual public joint briefing to report on our progress. Uh, the first thing was to decide, hey, the city feels a responsibility in it. The second is we want to report out, out on it so we can get public feedback at the same time and then hopefully get more public participation. So today is our first uh, report out to the community of our joint commitment to each other and we can assess whether doing it two times a year is the right thing or <laughs> one time a year but we certainly are committed to uh, uh, reporting out to the public. This next area is one that's more intense given all of the uh, facilities we have. And so this was to explore and better coordinate the joint use of our facilities that we have. We've made a huge amount of progress on this area in a relatively short uh, part of time. Uh, much of it focused on out of school time experience. So when you think about the assets that Louisville Metro has between our parks and our community centers, uh, these should become regular uh, centers of learning for our students. Our community centers uh, starting before the recession and through the recession uh, have not been invested in the way that they should be. Uh, we, are correct we are correcting some of that and you can see that through some just things that you would think would already be in place. But the presence of Wi-Fi in all of our communities uh, was not the case. But just in this past year, we've added Wi-Fi to Beachmont, Shawnee, Park, Portland, Southwick, and California community centers. Uh, we put com computer labs in in Beachmont, California, and Portland, and we're in the process of adding a, a compu computer lab at Southwick. All of our uh, public libraries, obviously, are, are good to go with Wi-Fi and uh, computers at the same time. Uh, we also wanted to increase our summer programming hours to add this time element that Donna Hargens talks about. And we've targeted teens with our summer job opportunities. We've gone from where there were zero summer jobs available to <coughs> 2,100 this past summer, and our goal is 2,500 uh, for this summer. And also Metro Parks Community Center staff participated with JCPS's engaging students through art training. And then Metro Parks, along with uh, Robbie Valentine, hosted a sports leadership camp in conjunction with JCPS over two sites this past summer. So it's natural for us to look for opportunities, and those are just a few examples. In addition, uh, JCPS and Urban League have expanded the street academy programming from what was one school to four schools. And we've gone from serving 25 uh, boys of color to 100 boys of color. And this was done in conjunction with the work that we do with our Office of Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods. Uh, we've also partnered with neighborhood places where we provide financial assistance to families in crisis and teach families how to be banked and build a credit rating if they don't have that already. Uh, and then we also uh, created a liaison between LMPD and JCPS that were if one of JCPS's students uh, witnesses uh, violence uh, which happens in the community, unfortunately. Uh, the, the principal and the teachers in the school know about it the next day. Uh, it can be traumatic for a child to see violence. They come to school, somebody says, what's wrong with this young person? And they could have gone through a traumatic event the night before, and JCPS obviously needs to know about that. So kudos to LMPD and JCPS for working on that program. Uh, also, We've improved, improved and expanded our learning places. These are sites and programs throughout the community which again extend learning time for students. Uh, all of our community centers are on their way to becoming learning places so JCPS students can come in and have availability to more resources. So far three of our community centers have been approved and we expect that every center with computer labs that we have will be a learning place as well. And then uh, working through safe and healthy neighborhoods, uh, we have uh, 
at Baxter Community Center, which is in Beecher Terrace, just three weeks ago. Uh, we were up and running with our first Code Louisville class there. That is a 15-week coding class that was uh, filled to capacity. And one of the points I like to make with our friends uh, from the media is we had uh, 15, we had 14 young guys of color and one gal of color there. And uh, one media person showed up toward the end. Uh, and we have lots of achievement taking place in the community with our students of color. Uh, but too often the media focuses on violence and other sensational <coughs> activities. We're encouraging them to show up when there's great accomplishments taking place at the same time. So please, uh, please see what's going on with the beach. This is what we, what we call it is coding at the beach. And then each of the 15 kids, when they uh, finish the class, will get a Chromebook as a recognition for their good work there. And then last, uh, when we took a look at one of, the one of the challenges about getting kids ready for kindergarten, uh, there can be a, up to a 30 million word gap between a stimulated advantage kid versus a kid that's not getting all the advantages. So the Louisville Free Public Library System came up with the concept of the thousand books before kindergarten race so that kids would be read to and they'd be stimulated by hearing uh, words and that program has had great success so that's been a lot of fun. It's good that we have a lot to report here, isn't it? There is a lot to report. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we work, we're working together on grant opportunities. So we collaborated on a whole uh, bunch of different uh, opportunities out there including districts of innovation. We also secured a COPS grant which means community oriented policing services for five additional SROs. We received a SAMHSA grant, which is Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and then a Youth Career Connect grant. And then we also helped with y'all's Race to the Top uh, application. So there's many areas that we're working together on this, including the Right Turn 1 and Right Turn 2 efforts. <coughs> These are mentoring efforts that are geared toward kids that have had some interface with the criminal justice system. And we know that if they're not interrupted in some way in terms of that type of experience, they can go down the wrong turn. So this mentor program uh, is available uh, to the kids so we can help get them on the right turn at the same time. So good progress being made there. And we talked about the importance of all of this being seamless and the sharing of data makes these things seamless. So the mayor talked about learning places and what makes that seamless is that students can log on to a program that they're actually using at school and that the providers of the out-of-school time act, um, activities can also see the data. Our kids attending school, how are they performing? So with um, permission from their parents, that information can be shared with out-of-school time providers. And then again, in order to be able to be successful at getting grants, uh, we have to share data about dropouts and achievement and readiness and discipline. Uh, discipline also. And then lastly, what we want to do is make sure that we're <coughs> preparing the next workforce for Louisville. And what that means is we have to align our, la our efforts toward what the market trends in labor uh, are. So what we do is with the alignment of our <coughs> five-star career academies, make sure that we're preparing students uh, for the next careers. And what's exciting to see is students at our high schools learning how to code, students at the beach learning how to code, because we know that's a huge workforce need uh, in Louisville right now. So that's a good segue into uh, a system that we introduced to the community about two weeks ago during my State of the City address, and then we had a sneak preview at this at the 55,000 degree board meeting in December. And that was to introduce the concept to the communities to start taking a look at education as a lifelong learning system. Uh, what prompted this was with, we have a very mature system with 55,000 degrees uh, that everybody on the board is very well aware of. And it, as we're at these meetings, some obvious questions you know, start coming up and over and over throughout the uh, five years that uh, 55,000 degrees has been underway. One is, are we prepare, are our students prepared to succeed in a 21st century economy? And are they receiving the right type of training and the right education? And then that's on the receiving side of the pull side of 55,000 degree. On the push side with JCPS, the question was, are our kids ready? Are they college and career ready? And what's the amount of remedial education that's required? 
Why do we have this amount of re remedial education? What's happening as we go into uh, post-secondary? So this system, any pillar in this system cannot be successful if all four pillars are not successful. So what we've done is introduce more of a systems type of thinking to this so people in the community can understand that this is all linked together. So it starts obviously, and I'll just spend a moment or two on this, with our youngest citizens. So the first pillar is called early care and educational kindergarten readiness. So it's all about getting kids ready for kindergarten so when they start at the age of six or so, they know all the basics, they know their numbers, they know their colors, they know their shapes, and they're ready to start learning. And we can get them to third grade reading level with as little drama as possible. This is likely to be the most challenged pillar of the four because of the funding issue that we talked about. So until our country has an epiphany and our political, ri our rival political parties can get their act together and come around on a logical point of educating our youngest kids, this is going to be a problem for us. So we need to be louder. We need to advocate <coughs> more for funding and for a quality even experience with all of our early care experiences at the same time. So it's hard if you don't start ready to get through the rest of the funnel, obviously. Uh, the second pillar is JCPS, so that's the K-12 experience. It's also our private and parochial schools. All of the participants in this pillar obviously have a huge amount of structure. Progress is being made, uh, so we just want to keep moving forward with that and be attentive, obviously, aware to the gaps that we have that we talked about before. But there's no lack of intentionality uh, taking place in the second pillar. The, th the third pillar, 55,000 degrees, as we talked about earlier, uh, was four-year college degrees, two-year college degrees, with, I would say, uh, increased attention now to apprenticeships, vocational and technical training as well, which result in sk skills and certifications that can be a pathway to a middle income job as well. Uh, three weeks ago, we announced a uh, manufacturing apprenticeship program. It's a dual credit program where uh, folks that are interested in manufacturing can get a two-year degree <coughs> while they're working and graduate without debt. So obviously that's a huge factor for many folks that are considering uh, two and four year d degrees. And then last is 21st century workforce. The reality is, and we all know this, the world's changing faster than ever. So are we lifelong learners so that we can adapt to the changing needs of the workforce? And not just to keep our head above water, but to create an economy where our citizens are earning above median wages so that we know the characteristics of that type of wage are a, an economy that's based on innovation, an economy that's outward looking, i.e. global and export intensive, and are we having the type of training and ongoing learning to ensure that we're keeping the, the head of the class in that regard. The adults that are able to pr uh, be successful in the fourth pillar, obviously, are thriving adults. And one of the leading indicators of having thriving children at the very first pillar is to have more thriving adults. So a principle in this is that everyone needs to be along for the ride. We're all in this together. So as you all do your work, and I know several of you all were at the 55,000 degree board meeting we had in December, others we've talked to about this, uh, just really continue to encourage the great work that you all are doing with systems thinking both on all the inputs and the output of this as well. And please let us know at the city how we can, how we can help in that regard. And Mayor, when I look at this visual, I look at our important part, and we do have an important part to play, but I also look at the support to the left of us and the support to the right of us, and we are certainly <coughs> not alone in this endeavor. So if you look at the JCPS part, and you think of our one page now, strategic plan, imagine, fitting that in that part. And if we can accomplish the goals in our strategic plan, we will be an integral part of the cradle to career uh, pipeline that the mayor's talking about. So I really want to publicly thank the mayor for not only talking about learning in every speech he gives, but also stepping up and asking the citizens of Jefferson County to step up and do something that supports education. So thank you, Mayor. My pleasure. You guys are great partners.
So, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, would you like to take a question or two? Sure. Okay. Colleagues, do we have a question or feedback for the Mayor and the Superintendent? This is an exciting joint effort, and the um, continuum, as you described it, lays it out really well. But yes, Ms. Duncan. Oh, just, just one question about the uh, completion rate, the college completion rate. Um, what, what do you see? I don't know if I missed this, or what do you see the role of the city in helping support that college completion rate? Because that's the, that's the, the final thing. Fifty-five thousand degrees. The, well, the, uh, the college completion. Yes. Okay. So 55,000 degrees is what we call a collective impact model. So no one group can do th achieve that by itself. So 55,000 degrees is a formal entity. Um, I chair it. Mary Gwen Wheeler is the executive director of it. We probably have uh, 40 members or so that meet on a regular basis representing uh, the school system, uh, the business community, the nonprofit community. Uh, all the rep all basically the system of what we have uh, here in a city so we're working on identifying what are those gaps in terms of getting kids ready uh, what are those gaps in terms of employment uh, where do we need additional funding so what you've seen is a gradual increase in uh, in results in 55,000 degrees so one of the things the city basically can do is we're a convener uh, when we ask people to come to uh, meetings they typically show up and they represent different aspects of the, of the community that may not be working together. And we can help, keep, help these groups work together. And we feel like that's really one of the main uh, positive things we can do in the mayor's office. Do you see the uni universities uh, taking part in this fully the way that, that we need them to do? The universities are, are fully engaged with 55,000 degrees. They're on the board there as well. Uh, they recognize their responsibility. I think I can speak for them both to produce graduates with critical thinking skills, but also that are directed toward the economic development strategy that we have in the city as well, so that those skills are relevant and that it can result in good jobs and good careers for them. Okay. And that includes from two-year institutions to four-year institutions. And I would say we've, we've, the community has grown together over the last five years with 55,000 degrees. One, it was kind of a revolutionary concept when it started <coughs> for people to come to the together around this joint uh, outcome we needed, but we knew we needed to do it to be successful as a regional economy here. And we're ahead of many cities in this regard uh, right now. So what you're seeing with the system here and apprenticeships and things like that are all the result of uh, inquiry and opportunities and exploring opportunities to improve with 55,000 degrees. Okay. Ms. Porter. I uh, just want to make a comment about the early childhood education. We are, as a board, looking at that, talking about it, and I wanted to give a special shout out to Kofi Darfu, who is heading a task force from Metro United Way, the work that they're doing, and uh, a shameless plug for 40210 and the work that the Bingham Fellows are doing with Metro United Way, the Louisville Free Public Library, um, to get the work done, because we also agree that if we have students ready, as they enter kindergarten, it will make their road a little easier to travel. So thank you for supporting that. We support it as well. And what we know is education is a community initiative. So thank you. Okay. Well, and I'd, I'd like to put a plug in for more advocacy. Uh, there's about 10 states right now that are providing universal pre-K for their students. Uh, some of them have been in doing this long enough now that you're seeing increases in third grade reading <laughs> levels. So we don't have to just accept this as the status quo, okay? And so often with government, uh, citizens feel somewhat passive or powerless, but if we can start a movement of saying we're not gonna take this anymore, and our youngest citizens do need to be ready for school, then we can achieve results. So it can be dispiriting at time when you're working uh, with the government or working against the government, uh, but we, we shouldn't settle for the status quo in this area. So I would encourage you all and all of our interest groups in the community to be vocal about this need. I, I, something everybody agrees on, you know, but you just have to say, well, am I, am I willing to pay a little bit more uh, in taxes, the dreaded word, a year to make sure that our youngest students, students are prepared? Well, what better investment could we make? And so this, the states that have done this, they will ultimately have a 
competitive advantage on us because their students will be better prepared for a 21st century workforce. So we need to move with a sense of urgency on this. Okay. Mr. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for being here this evening. We really do appreciate your partnership with this and your leadership in this area. My question is, and I don't realize I'm going to uh, preference this by saying I understand I'm about to preach to the choir here, but my concern is um, from an infrastructure standpoint from Louisville and in regards to uh, broadband access. And I know that we're looking at, we've tried to become, uh, to get Google Fiber in here and we are, have three bids that are out to be able to um, expand our network access. One of the things that is a concern to me is I would like to see if there <coughs> would be some type of commitment or plan on the, uh, the city's part to be able to roll out maybe free wireless broadband access to areas of our town that are dis economically disadvantaged. Uh, code Louisville is great. Coding at the beach is awesome. But when these students go home, not, uh, very, very often they don't have access to broadband internet. And it's something that as a board member, and even though this is, it generally is not in my particular district, that's something that I think would be a great investment and produce long-term dividends to the city if we can do that. Now, I know that's not necessarily something that's in this particular report, but it's something that comes to mind uh, in some of conversations I've had with folks from Google, from students uh, that have also, um, you know, gone through some of these programs. Uh, it's just something that I think that I'd like to see the city be able to be, I don't know, maybe roll out a pilot or uh, think a little bit outside the box on that. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. Uh, not only do we want more speed, you know, that's what most people talk about. We want a gigabit in the city. We also need more access to the point that you're making. You know, there's carrier issues like that we're wor that we're working through, but uh, internet service broadband is as critical an issue as providing water and electricity to every house in our view, and it's an issue that we continue to work on. And we're we're somewhat we have we have the big dense cities above us and we have smaller cities beneath us and our intermediate sized cities like us face some challenges right now that we're addressing but we're committed to the type of goal that you set forth there. Okay. Well, Mr. Mayor, I, um, thank you. I've got one um, comment and question. Um, we've made a ton of progress in um, this collaborative already. Um, the U of L six-year graduation rate, for example, in response to Ms. Duncan's question, it's moved from, I guess, 28 percent when we started this journey to 52 percent or something like that. So there's a lot of evidence that this intentional mutual accountability can work. Um, but um, you're carrying a very important ball for the community right now in this lift agenda. And I want to, I guess, comment about the view at least from this JCPS board member about how state funding of schools is another example of a problem that we're trying to get after. Um, we get a significantly smaller per student amount from the state than the average district in Kentucky and um, the rationale is that we're one of the richer districts in Kentucky which is true but when you look, for example, at our school buildings, we have some beautiful ones. We met two weeks ago at a beautiful facility at Valley. We've got some beautiful new buildings, and we've seen you know, a new uh, construction plan. But we also have a lot of old infrastructure here, and we don't have it in our control right now to really invest very far beyond the state. So uh, I know you've talked about Oklahoma City and their example, they put money um, the citizens chose to put money into the schools, but sort of <coughs> when you get lift passed, what's in it for us? <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, let's talk about what lift is. Uh, uh, lift is uh, local investments for transportation, so it's the it's a change in our state constitution that is required, so that our the citizens of Kentucky will have the opportunity to vote on specific <coughs> capital projects on the ballot. So there'll be capital projects with clear definition and cost as to what they are and uh, we would pay with them uh, with a time limited up to 1% sales tax uh, and then once the pre-identified amount of money is raised then that tax goes away. 37 other states already have this, uh, this right. 
So we are right in the thick of it as we speak. And this week there should be a vote in the House. It's House Bill 1. Well, hopefully that will get out and then go to the Senate. And it will go to a referendum before all the citizens in November of 2016 to see if we should have this right. Once we do that, then the question is a community, if they want, will have the option to put these capital projects on the ballot. They don't have to, obviously. We just want this as one of the tools in the economic development toolbox. The way those projects will be selected in Jefferson County is uh, there's a, there will be a capital investment commission made up of seven members of the Metro Council, four members representing the Jefferson County League of Cities, six at-large members, two from each of the old A, B, and C uh, districts, one state senator, one state representative, and a chair. So they will represent geographically the community. And the intent then is for community transformational projects to be identified. So let's say completing the Louisville Loop. It's about an $85 million <coughs> project. Putting gigabit uh, throughout the community. Uh, it's another large project. That's about $250 million uh, project. And then there'll be specific uh, <coughs> projects. Let's say parks throughout the community. Now, if the community came up with some way that there is a uh, partnership with the schools, that's on the table, you know, but there has to be the will built throughout the community to identify that as a project. And then once that package of projects is selected, it then goes to the Metro Council. They're the local governing body that has to approve something to go on the ballot, and they will either accept the recommendations 100 percent or reject it, but they can't fiddle with it. Mm -hmm. And then it would go on the ballot. So it will be part of a community process, Mr. Chair, that will I'm sure it would be very robust because there's a lot of needs. That being said, a 1 percent sales tax generates $150 million a year for the community. So for some perspective on that, Waterfront Park downtown, over its 25 years, that project's about a $120 million project. So there could be something of that scope happening in the community every year. Not necessarily a park, but it could be public transportation, the loop, fiber. Uh, et cetera. So it's quite significant. It would change the landscape of our community. Great. Thank you for your leadership on that. You're welcome. If there are no further questions, um, I think we want to thank you once again for coming here and thank both of you for your leadership. This is a really important and significant thing about our city, um, the way these really important um, efforts of government work together. So on behalf of the whole board, I want to thank you for being here. Our pleasure. Thank you all. all right. thank you. Great. Uh, Okay, is there a motion to receive this report? Mr. Brady moves, Ms. Porter seconds. All in favor, aye. Passes unanimously. Great. Um, the next item on our agenda, although I guess I did promise, does anyone want to uh, take a moment and leave now? The students mostly split, but I said, uh, I said we could. Okay, the next item on our agenda, um, still in the information items phase, is the Board of Education Discussion Agenda Planning Calendar. Are there any comments or additions to the planning calendar? Ms. Duck Ms. Well, just, just a comment. You yeah. know, um, I still don't, don't see um, some things on there that I had requested, and I just need to know if I just need to quit requesting them or, or they're going to be covered in some other way. Uh, Dr. Hargens, I know uh, just wanting an annual report on uh, our um, claims and how we uh, do our payouts on lawsuits and, and the annual report on attendance and suspensions and those things in um, program reviews. Um, but I mean, I don't see it on the calendar, so should I just assume that you want to answer these some other way? Actually, Ms. Duncan will either put information on the Friday update or we will include it in the, in the calendar. So uh, we'll make sure you know when you're going to get those. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a question of broader interest um, to the board members for sure. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Um, 
am I on here? Yeah. I, I would be um, interested to have a report on the school resource officer program. I, I'm really interested to know a little bit of the history of that program and when it was adopted and the goals and if we're making progress toward those goals and if there may be some um, unintended <coughs> consequences of the program. So I, I would be very interested in that topic. Okay, I just want to um, call attention to the fact that uh, two things about our next board meeting, February 23rd. First, it will take place at Central High School, assuming we agree to that when we vote on the consent agenda in a moment. Um, and second, that there will be a work session before the 7 o'clock meeting on both the annual Head Start um, governance training, but also an overview of what's going on in early childhood. So there's been a lot of information that we've all received about the Brigant scores and, you know, as the mayor talked about, and there, there's a lot of swirling around, but um, I think um, the leadership team is going to try to put that in some kind of context for us so we understand JCPS's responsibilities, what is happening outside of our walls in the community and how kind of it all fits together. So those are um, important things coming up in two weeks. Um, is there a motion to receive the planning calendar? Okay, Dr. Wilner votes. Mr. Hathaway seconds. All in favor, aye. Passes unanimously. I believe we have one tie bid. Vice Chair Porter. Well, the tie bid this evening is for uh, instructional and office supplies, and it goes to John R. Green Company, Green Group Enterprises. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair Porter. Um, there are no speakers on the consent calendar, um, so let us move into uh, consideration of this next. Are there any items that uh, board members would like to discuss? Ms. Duncan? Uh, just a, a couple questions on R. Okay. R, are there any other matters? Okay, Ms. Duncan, would you like to proceed on item R, approval yeah. of amendment to option agreement, et cetera. Yes, this is the uh, concerning the joint use of the gym. And um, I'm just wondering, I, I saw that it, I read in there that it's supposed to be designed like Stouffer Farmer, I, I suppose, uh, gym. S but we have an adult YMCA and a Stouffer Farmer gym. So I don't, I haven't been, I haven't looked carefully at the Stouffer Farmer gym. Are those, um, is that, designed for adults or for kids? We are, we are basing the gym off of what we call our basic prototypical gym. There are some uh, modifications being made to the gym at the YMCA's request and also then on the YMCA's dime to make some of those accommodations having to do with basketball goals, setting them up in a different configuration so there could be cross-court games played and that type of thing. But we're using Basically, if you think about it like a, like a car, we're using our basic frame and then making some modifications to it to uh, also work with the YMCA. So it will be able to, uh, adults could, will be able yes. to play on the, on the basket size. And then I had a question about supervision, after school supervision. I know the gym, access to the gym then, unless the school is using it, access to the gym will be limited. Uh, and, and I assume locked from the school side and then open toward the YMCA side. And I assume the facilities outside, outside facilities, will be under some system of supervision. Have you all decided how that supervision will look? Personnel-wise, obviously not <coughs> yet, but for example, the preschool area that is close to the gym will be fenced off. And if, if there'll be some renderings that you'll be getting this week and you'll see that the fence is even drawn in on the renderings. But then absolutely the, uh, the gym during YMCA times will be locked off from the school and vice versa and we'll have security systems state of the art to make sure that those are secure in either situation. Very good. Okay, thank okay. you. Mr. Brady? 
Uh, just to a point regarding the gyms at Stouffer and Farmer, uh, uh, Member Duncan, just to let you know that both of those schools reside in my district and I'm actually in Farmer's Gym quite often and they are full-size gyms. So that is something that can accommodate adult usage versus and also um, uh, student usage. Um, they, they, the way the basketball goals are located, they can be lowered from the ceiling so they can be can reconfigured as Dr. Razor said. So just want to let you know okay. about that. I've seen very that good. in action. Yep, very good. Thank Great. you. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? Okay, uh, Ms. Duncan moves, Mr. Brady seconds, all in favor, aye. Okay, that passes, thank you very much. So I'm happy to confirm that the next board meeting on February 23rd will in fact be at Central High School. Um, we're now gonna move on to board reports and requests and uh, other matters that board members would like to report. Mr. Brady, Ms. Horn, Ms. Duncan, All right. Dr. Wilmer. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Port. Uh, I'm sorry, Chair <laughs> Jones. <laughs> old right, habits I'm die right hard. Thing. This is good. Um, I want to talk about a couple of issues here. Uh, one of these, I guess, could have been talked. Uh, I piggyback on what uh, <laughs> Member Wilner uh, brought uh, talked about but regarding uh, student resource officers. Um, I understand, obviously, and I'm very thankful that Dr. Hargens uh, raised that issue a little bit early in her report. Um, but I would like to know what our, uh, after the investigations have completed, what our processes are and how they can be improved based on this incident. Um, and also some reasoning, there's some, some question as to why are the officers are allowed to return back to the school. It'd be nice to have some uh, content, uh, or context uh, rather, uh, behind that, uh, that particular decision or not de non-decision as the case may be. Uh, that would be useful. Um, also, regarding uh, the alternative uh, schools, uh, Dr. Hensley earlier talked about that success, uh, success pathways, and um, I think that it looks like you're redesigning the entire program. Uh, I, I thank you very much for doing that, uh, but it's something that you said has been under consideration for two years now, um, and I am uh, actually very pleased to hear that you're gonna be bringing that report to the board in March rather than what I had heard through the media in April because it's a lot better to give us more time to digest that. Uh, that the, um, the, the personnel and staff at especially Kennedy Metro really does need to know uh, more about that and the sooner the better. And I also understand you're gonna be talking to our staffs, not only at Kennedy, but at all these different schools. So it's something that I do encourage that it's a free flowing um, uh, exchange of information and that it's done so without any, um, done so in a very open manner. So there's lots of uh, opinions that can be expressed willingly and freely. Um, in regards to that, I understand that we might be able to save some funds by uh, arranging things in a certain way. And one of the things that I'd like you to consider is um, this, if we are gonna be combining more grades together in these alternative schools, that we consider providing bus monitors for all of the schools, or all these buses going to these schools, especially if they're going to be transporting students in uh, larger uh, sets of grades, um, because that's something that is of a concern, not only to me as a board member, but to the community. I've heard that concern expressed, and I know that concern has been expressed by uh, bus drivers, so that's something that I do encourage you to take a look at. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is um, I'm in a really kind of a unique position of my day job working for Norton Healthcare. And I had a uh, pre-existing meeting that uh, with some of the management at uh, Cozier Children's Hospital on Friday afternoon. So it turns out Friday morning, we had a particularly uh, eventful morning in the uh, Cozier Children's ED as one of our buses was rear-ended by a semi. Thankfully, all those uh, folks have been discharged from the hospital from minor injuries, my understanding is. Um, but there was a point in my discussion of talking to the KCH staff that, uh, that was an interesting point, and it's something that you know, I'm not sure if Dr. Razor may want to look at this from a safety standpoint or operational standpoint, but the concern was that some of these uh, children that were brought into KCH or Kosher Children's Hospital, sorry for the acronyms, um, were um, very young to the point where they had some difficulty trying to ID some of these students. And the reason being is, you know, through a traumatic event like that or being in a strange situation, some students, or some students there might be some communication issues <coughs> and even different languages spoken, that they're, they were having some difficulty trying to make sure they had the correct identity and age and, and just basic information like that. And also not even for just to identify them and see if they're within their electronic medical record system, 
but also how to turn those students over to the parents when they show up and provide proper identification. So the, the uh, manager had spoken about having kids wear lanyards and because she was talking about her ID badge and I reminded her that I forget my ID badge sometimes <laughs> and I know that kids will certainly forget those or exchange lanyards and that can uh, have a whole host of other problems. But this is an issue that's actually of a concern across the country, not here, just in JCPS, and this is, happens whether you're in California or whether you're in Illinois, this is an issue that's all across the nation that they have concern about this. But I thought if we might be able to look at ways of trying to deal with that, or at least try and find some way of having some type of on-site support or uh, emergency personnel trying to tag these kids as they're going to transport to a hospital. And uh, one other interesting tidbit about that meeting was uh, they had learned something from the accident that happened in 2012 where we had another bus that got T-boned and it flipped. We had some injuries with those students and those students were transported uh, to different hospitals. Now that's not something that JCPS controls. I just want you all to understand that. Um, but what they had learned was that in that particular situation and they put it into effect in this particular situation was that parents will normally go to KCH first because that is our pediatric children's hospital. It's also our only level one trauma center for kids. So what they decided to do is they actually had a room, they, they had already had a system in place, they brought the parents in and they were able to find where that uh, kid was and redirect that parent if they were at another facility. So that's something that I thought was pretty neat and I thought that's something that as an operations director, you might want to know about that, and also the board might want to know about that, is that not only are, can we learn from our, uh, our um, previous experiences, but obviously so is our hospitals and the rest of our community as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Horn? Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to pass out, um, there's some flyers, Dr. Hargan's right there. There's two different ones. Um, in the East End, uh, we have a, it's something called Kids Etc. And it is free tutoring. Um, and it is, it is something that's really needed in the East End. Um, we serve children in the elementary school level. It's um, brought to you by JCPS, our resource centers within our schools. And um, it serves novice and apprentice, you know, children that are identified a lot of times through the teachers. Uh, because the question I have is we don't have community centers, you know, really in the East End. We don't have a community school either. Now that Myers has closed as a community school, a lot of our children were, um, if they needed a community school where they could get um, we have one library in Middletown, um, and then, you know, but that's it. And so we're, we have a, you know, lack of community schools, a lack of learning centers, no neighborhood place. And so we do have a growing affordable housing population. Um, we also are one of the three hot spots for immigrants in our area along Westport Road. So there is a huge number of children that are on the waiting list for these, you know, for the free tutoring. Um, and so the idea is we need to try to figure out some, you know, we are, you know, have community partnerships. Um, there are two churches, Hirschborn Baptist and Ninth and O. Um, we're reaching into that district. I'm not sure who, which board member has that Ninth and O Baptist, which is on Breckenridge and Bardstown Road. But my East End Tutoring Center is reaching into that neighborhood okay. also. Um, you know, so it's just kind of an interesting puzzle. I'd like to see a report on, you know, maybe some activity could be with the mayor's office to try to, you know, find, you know, resources for community center, learning center, neighborhood places in the East End to serve this growing population. And then also just recruiting of volunteers, that's the puzzle, um, how we can find volunteers for this growing wait, waiting list. Um, the JCPS with limited funds, I think our budget um, is, you know, a blessing to have $6,000. We do have one staff member that travels each day to a different, one of the different sites, but that's just one staff member. And then we're trying to piece it together, you know, with the volunteers. So it's a tremendous program, um, but we just would like to see how we could expand it w using you know more volunteers more sites um, with the 
internet capability and those resources. Okay, thank you, and uh, apologies if this is out of order, but I wonder if you would like to say a word about the board um, work project that's coming up? Just yeah, some, it's not the details absolutely. are not all worked out, but give um, everybody a heads up. I was inspired, um, you know, joining the school board um, is just, a, it's such an honor to serve our community and being kind of always a team player and I've been a swim coach for a number of years and just always being a part of a team. One of the things that I've always found that was really great for a group such as like our school board is to have a service project that we can get involved together. And so I had approached our chair, David, um, about, you know, what could we do? And I had an idea um, with uh, Diane Porter's um, wonderful, uh, what are they called? What are they called? Libraries? Preschool Little libraries? Library. Yeah, front yard libraries. And so we're just starting to coordinate um, with um, Youth Build and Mazik and, uh, we have uh, our bank, Fifth Third Bank, and Keller Williams to be collection sites for books for preschoolers. And we will do, during the Mayor's Day of Service, we will offer it, um, you know, this opportunity for us to have a wonderful team building <coughs> time to build some of these libraries, um, and then also join in with some students and, you know, and invite the community. We, we have several community groups that are inspired to join us. Um, and I think it'll be a great, you know, a great opportunity to have a good, you know, some good fun, have some good teamwork, um, team building, and then also contribute kind of in a, in a multifaceted way um, with a lot of multi-ages, and I'm really excited about it, so I'm stay excited. tuned. I'm excited about it, too. We can get out our hammers and deal with something concrete. Yeah, some of us will be painting and not <laughs> hammering, but uh, there'll be work for everybody, you know, to okay. do. So. Great. Okay, thank you. Ms. Duncan. Well, I had uh, a request about the placement of the calendar. Uh, one thing I'd like for us to think about is maybe moving uh, the, the calendar um, discussion more toward the end of the meeting uh, because sometimes during the consent agenda, things will arise that, that we will need to have added to the calendar. So I'll just request that we think about that, trying to maybe move the calendar discussion a little bit um, toward the end of the meeting. and. Another request I would like to have, I hear this data at different schools where they say 7% are kindergarten ready first grade, but are uh, kindergarten ready at the first of the year, but then at the end of the year, they've got a big percent, 98% ready for first grade. I don't know if that data is kept all over the district, but I would certainly love to see that uh, when kids come in no matter what their kindergarten readiness rate is, what is it for first grade? Are they ready for first grade at the end of that time? Kindergarten's what we control, and um, I would love to uh, see how our schools do in that. I've had several tell me that, but I've never seen all the schools and all the data on it, so I, I would appreciate that. And uh, one other thing, um, I just attended the National School Boards Association advocacy conference in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, Debbie Westland was our coordinator of all the, our meetings. We had eight meetings with our congressmen, and um, I think only, only uh, Senator McConnell was not able to make the meeting. Everyone else was there, uh, and uh, so gracious. Um, but our, we were there to advocate on behalf of the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind modernized and the modernized version returns more local control to uh, to the to the districts to the states and to the districts and uh, we were also there to, to try and get more local control in terms of the Child Nutrition Act um, because uh, the guidelines are so stringent that the, the national guidelines are so stringent that uh, our, the cost of our lunches have uh, risen, they, they, it costs more to produce these lunches and also um, participation from the students has dropped a little bit. And this is not just a Kentucky situation, this is all over the country. So we were there to advocate for basically those two issues and um, just had a tremendous experience with all of our congressional representatives and it made me so proud 
of those that represent uh, Kentucky. Great, thank you, and thank you for going on our behalf. We appreciate it. Indeed, Lloyd. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Wilmer. Just a, a quick, um, Dr. Hargan's already alluded to it, but the uh, Kentucky Museum of Art and Craft, the wonderful uh, reception for the, all the uh, Scholastic Art Award winners, and JCPS dominated the show. <laughs> students from all over the district, I was so impressed. And not only the students, but all the wonderful art teachers who are doing such fabulous work with our students. So uh, just a, a shout out to those students. Uh, and, and their teachers. Um, and I also, I visited three schools this week. They were return visits, all of them, but I had the pleasure of going with Area Superintendent Dr. Paige Hartstern, uh, and we're gonna be visiting all our schools in common together. And I just wanna um, thank Smyrna, Moore, and Hartstern, um, the principal and the teachers and the uh, students for being so welcoming. Uh, I'll, I'll be back again, but they were wonderful visits. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hadaway. Just a request, Dr. Hargens. Um, I would like to understand, um, as we presented, uh, the bus monitor and overview. How is that? How are needs assessed? Uh, what's primary responsibility? How is it funded? Uh, how is that broken down in numbers uh, based on compound? So, thank you. Okay, Chris, do you have anything? Okay, um, I have one uh, quick report. Um, I had the opportunity on Sunday evening, which I guess was last night, to attend the Teach Kentucky recruitment uh, reception. It uh, took place at Impella's Aries, and we've heard as a board from Teach Kentucky, but um, it's, it's uh, I mean, I think this is something that the district should feel um, very proud of and that Louisville probably needs to understand, sorry, the mayor's not here, but to sort of get our self-concept right, um, 300 um, university graduates from around the country, um, mostly from selective top schools, have applied. 30 of them were invited to come to, uh, you know, to interview, and I believe they've been interviewing today and perhaps tomorrow. But um, last night there were probably 150 people, including the 30, so the rest were um, folks from the community. There were a lot of principals there, a lot of our current teachers, our head of human resources, and uh, you know a lot of folks from the different parts of the community. But um, from the perspective of college <coughs> students around you know the United States, JCPS has it going on as a place to come and uh, think about starting your career as a teacher. We've also been, I think, highly selective compared to national competitive programs in this, like Teach for America, at keeping um, our young students who come nationally in the profession. We've been extremely successful at keeping them in the profession. Some move away, but we've also been very successful at keeping them teaching <coughs> in JCPS. So great evening, um, and just the perspective of you know, 300 people want to come here and we only choose to interview 10% 10, 10 is um, it, it's something that we ought, to, we ought to feel good about that we're that desirable um, to, as a place to come. So um, that is all I have. Um, I think, you know, just in closing, I want to, yes, sorry, Ms. Porter. I had three things that I wanted to mention. Um, on February the 3rd, yeah. we were at Mazik Middle School and I'm very excited to say that the APP, APP team from Mazik right. won national, beyond state, national honors from Verizon. Each of the students received a tablet um, and their advisor received a, a tablet and the school has received $20,000 to help um, ramp up anything that pertains to uh, educational tools for the students, so that's very exciting. And uh, it was a surprise. The students w were called to the auditorium because they thought they were in trouble. Oh. <laughs> so, um, and their parents were called the morning of and asked to come to the school. Oh. So there was a lot of excitement in that auditorium. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Wheat was there and it was just great. Dr. Hargan spoke, but they were so excited. So uh, I think we always, you know, can always find a good news story to tell. So that's my story for February the 3rd. 
And then on February the 5th, I was at the Kentucky International Convention Center because no middle school jazz ensemble performed at the Kentucky Music Educators Association and they did a fantastic job, just fantastic. And Saturday I had the opportunity to be on uh, WLOU radio on a student leadership broadcast. So I'd like to thank Reagan Roy, who is a student at Manual, and his sister Madison Roy, who is a sister uh, student at Crosby Middle School. So those are three wonderful success stories for JCPS. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Porter. Do you have anything else? Okay. Um, I want to close just by um, thanking my colleagues and also all of the presenters. We had, I think, two very productive work sessions. I think we had a lot of interchange both among ourselves and with the leadership team and with some of the other folks. We got into some pretty heavy issues around equity, um, you know, some reality sandwich kind of issues um, there, and um, we are determined to continue to improve, and um, this was a great session. So thank you all, and is there a motion to adjourn? Okay, Mr. Brady moves. Oh, oh, oh. Speakers. Speakers. Speakers, my bad. Sorry, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn it. I'll get it. <laughs> okay, we do have three speakers um, on the agenda. Um, I apologize, and we'll call you up. The first is Mertis Strong. Thank you. Did I pronounce that right? Murder Strong, all right. Mr. Strong, you have three minutes. Let me, let, let, me, let me summarize the rules for you before we go. You got three minutes to address the board. At the end of two and a half minutes, a bell will sound. And then you have 30 seconds to wind up. And at the end of three minutes, the bell sounds twice. Let's get it done. That way. Well, first of all, I thank God for being here. This has been a good meeting. I was at uh, one we had in Valley Station. I was uh, there on behalf with Bishop Dennis B. Lyons, Unity in the Community. And I think you guys said some pretty good stuff. You really did. Uh, I think the mayor and Superintendent Harkins said that we need the community involved. And I think we're going to see more of that in the future. As I uh, you know, I was raised, I was, uh, came out of Jefferson County Public Schools, and back then, I originally had come to talk about aptitude testing, uh, finding out where a child's natural abilities were. But then as I listened, and I listened, and I listened, I said, no, I don't want to say that, I want to say something else. And so I said, how can I get the most out of these three minutes? And I got to thinking about Solomon, King Solomon. Solomon said, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. And as many good ideas as we have, I think that what our children need most of all is to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that we need to reintroduce in our schools uh, a voluntary class where children can learn something about character and integrity. As a matter of fact, I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ would give children an education in common sense one-on-one. -on -one. For example, let's see if I got a trash in my pocket. If I got trash in my pocket, I don't throw my trash on the ground. I learn to put my trash where it belongs. And I think that we have too much competition as far as everybody striving to excel. And we have forgotten about the basics. Is that my bear? What does that say? That's, I got 30, 30 seconds. seconds. I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to give you all the 30 seconds. The gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be, I don't care about any other city, but in Louisville, Kentucky, the city that I love, I think we need the gospel of Jesus Christ back in our schools. Thank you. Have a great day.
Thank you, Mr. Strong. I uh, made an error. We actually have four speakers. Um, the next one is Thelma Banks. Ms. Banks, thank you for being here tonight. You have three minutes. At the end of two and a half, the gong will sound once, and at the end of three, it will sound twice. So thank you for being with us. Good afternoon, Dr. Hargens, uh, Chair, Chairman Jones, and the other board members. My name is Thelma Banks, and I'm here with the Derby City Dynamite women's semi-professional tackle football team. We're the only fo women's tackle football team in Kentucky. And the reason that I'm here is I had emailed uh, Dr. Hargens and um, spoken with the realtor office on the possibility of renting out JCPS uh, facilities for us to be able to play our games. We are with the largest women's tackle league in the whole United States, uh, teams ranging from Boston to California. We've already um, spoken with the mayor in hopes of trying to get the city of Louisville to be able to help us out with the rental facilities. However, they can't support our needs. We actually need stadiums. Um, we've been in contact with the realtor office over about the last 10 years, trying to rent out JCPS schools. Um, they indicated that in 2006, there was an accident where the school system was uh, sued by an adult team. However, um, I guess that the, that individual or that organization did not have insurance. Um, I pulled up all of the KSRs and all of the policies uh, regarding rental of fa school facilities, and I feel like we do meet the qualifications. Um, one, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, we do put back into the school systems. We've been out to a couple of different schools talking about bullying. We fed the homeless. Um, we went out to Central High School and helped out with the clothes drive. Uh, we offer sports and youth clinics for free. We're here for the community. Um, but we just need community support to come back to us. So I would like to request that the board would reconsider the possibility of us renting out JCPS facilities. Um, and in the KSRs that was provided to me by Mr. Franklin Jones, he indicated that the use of school property um, is not allowed. However, <coughs> uh, KSR 162.055, the use of school property by public for recreational, sporting, academic, literary, artistic, or community use, limo, uh, excuse me, limited civil immunity. Um, 1E, sport, means an activity requiring physical exertion skill in which by its nature an organization is competitive, includes a set of rules, and is generally accepted in the community as a sport. Number two is a local school board may authorize the use of school property by public members of the community during non-school hours for the purpose of recreation, sport, academic, literacy, artistic, or community use and persuasion to the policies adopted by the school board. So I'm just asking that you guys would reconsider. Um, I don't know if it's a, a vote you guys could put forth or, or something like that, but it would be a, cla a cash influx into JCPS because we are willing to pay. We do have an, a million dollar insurance policy. Okay, thank you very much. And um, we appreciate you being with us tonight. Our, um, <laughs> our practice is to, when there's a request is to ask the superintendent to work it uh, within the organization and to represent the board in getting back to you or recommending action to us. So that's where it goes, thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Pat Bennett. Okay. Thank you for being here this evening. And once again, three minutes, uh, one bell after two and a half, two at the end of three. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Pat Bennett, and I am here on behalf of uh, Derby City Dynamites, which is the football team that was just yep. up here. Um, this is, I'm, I'm a rookie. I'm from Cincinnati. I came from Cincinnati uh, about a year ago. Hadn't heard anything about women being able to play football. As a child growing up, you know, that's something that I wanted to do. Couldn't do it. There was rules. There was regulations. Females could not play football. And not only had I heard about this team when I moved, but I heard it was the best in Kentucky. So I wanted to be a part of a team. And not only are we a team, but we're a family. We go out and we help each other, not only play football, but if somebody is in need of a ride to practice or, you know, hey, I need your help moving this weekend, guess what? 
we all as a group come together and do that. My stepson actually plays for Derby City Cardinals. He is actually allowed to play on your guys' facility because he is a, they are a part of the JP, JPCS. Unfortunately, we are not. But like Ms. Ms. Banks said, we are willing to give back. Everybody on the team players, pays pay, players' fees. That'll come back to you guys as well. Not only will that, it'll keep our fan base in Louisville. If we have to go outside of Louisville, we lose our fan base. That means no money's coming to you guys, it's gonna go to another school. My kid goes to school in Jefferson County and I'm trying to get him into a traditional program so I would like to see the money come to you guys as well. So if you guys could please just reconsider us, this would be a dream for a rookie like me to finish and have a great season. Because we plan on bringing home the championship this year, guys. All right. We plan on bringing it home. We've got a great team. We, we do, we've got a great team. And like I said, not only are we a team, but we are family. Us women stick together. And we have a great facility that we work out in, which is the YMCA. They have supported us 100% in giving up their facilities two nights a week from 7 to 9.30 at night so we can get physically fit. So I'm just asking you guys, please, please consider giving us a field so we do not lose our fan base in Louisville, Kentucky. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Great. All right. Thank you. And the fourth speaker is Stacy Bennett. Oh, yeah, three minutes. All right. Hello. Thank you, guys. Again, my name is Stacy Bennett. I'm a board member for the Derby City Dynamite. Um, here on behalf to ask our last plea for help to find a home field for us to play on. Um, as Ms. Banks and the other Ms. Bennett told you, we are Louisville based. We're the only women's semi-pro tackle football. There you go. In Louisville, or in Kentucky. Um, we have, sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, many of our children, um, that we're all mothers, of course, mothers, aunts, grandmothers, aunts, we're all, Many of our children attend JCPS. They come to practice. Um, my son is here with us tonight because he supports us in what we do. He, you know, a lot of us are single moms that they don't have the dads around. And if they can see their moms out here making something in themselves, they can play sports, they can do it. You know, this, this helps the students in their journey through life and through school. Um, we just want to be as, you know, they said, we just want to stay in Louisville. We want to play here. The other facilities that we, you know, we go to Detroit, Cleveland, Chattanooga, um, Alabama. They have facilities for us to use. And we've invited these people here to play. And we don't have anywhere for them to go. So we, you know, again, just ask that you all reconsider changing the rules. Um, as Ms. Banks stated, we do have a million dollar policy. And it is in your bylaws that we need that policy to play. We are more than willing to pay up front for any rental fees for the facilities. Um, we, you know, we'll take care of facilities. If the children are allowed to play on your fields, on the JCPS fields, and you know, use the facilities, us as adults will be able to play there, keep it clean, um, just have a good time. And more than anything, children in the JCPS district seeing women succeed at something other than, you know sitting behind a desk because women do play sports and you know and women's sports are coming up and up you more and more you hear about women teenage women in high school being on the football team being kickers doing this doing that and we just want to be recognized and the same support as the men and even the children get okay thank you for being here tonight. thank you and derby city dynamite all right great That concludes our speakers. Um, there is no need for an executive session this evening. So now, if there is a motion to adjourn, Mr. Brady moves, Dr. Wilner seconds. All in favor, aye. Thank you, everyone.